Um, you know, this is such interesting territory to talk about, um, both in terms of the war stories and in terms of both the literalness of the process and also sort of the mystery or enigma of it. And it occurred to me that the person really to start with is the one that's really important, which is the man to my left. Uh, you know, because yeah. there, are, there are writers and there are creators and there are showrunners, but really this town in many ways is, of course, about agents. So I'm referring to Mark Foreman, who at one time I think was known, as, weren't you known as the king of the single season? That all the shows. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I'm the queen of the single Kevin's season. Kevin's going to fire me for that. That's my fire me for that. You're a journeyman, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's one step up from the king of the pilot. <laughs> now, that's changed, though, because of, among that's other things, like Pushing Daisies, right? Pushing Which is sexy money. Is gonna, you know, so now he's, he's uh, yes, both are coming back. Yes. So, uh, I thought I'd put him on the spot just even to talk about, before we get to actually how a show is made, conceived, even to have Mark talk a little about sort of what he looks for, you know, what how, sort of, not specifically how the market is changing. I think that's a larger question that hopefully we'll get to later. But just uh, a sense of, you know, what it takes as an agent, as a sort of what executives are looking for before we get to the actual writers who have to have to do the job? Well, um, I would basically call one of these five people and say, what do you got? Um, and say, that's great. Now, uh, you know, you, you listen to the executives and typically they try to articulate what it is they're looking for and what it is they want. And if you listen to that at the very beginning of the development season, then you at the very end of the development season, when shows get on the air, typically there's not a lot of consistency. Um, sometimes they'll suggest what they might want, and you can even talk about that more than I can talk about that. Um, but more often than not, I believe it, it, a good idea is a good idea. And you sort of know it when you hear it, and I think the networks are sort of the same. Um, it's sort of if you build it, they'll come. Lately, it feels like most of the networks, without saying it, I think, are saying, again, without saying it, I just want something you can put on the side of a bus and uh, people will tune in just based on whatever it is that just drives by. Um, and unfortunately, that's the world in which we live. And you know, it, it's funny, I, I, from recently I keep hearing the analogy that the network television business is turning into sort of the tentpole feature business, the summers, you gotta open. Um, whereas the cable outlets are turning sort of more into the independent feature business where there may be things that will be given some time to breathe. Um, but I, I really believe it's just when you hear it, you kind of know it, and um, it, you have to be passionate about it. I, w I will say that when you are selling to the networks or the cable outlets, it seems to take a life on of its own, meaning if you have a pitch that's really, really good, and you kind of know when it's really good, typically they all want it. And so, uh, you know, and, and you sort of have that, that feeling at the very beginning of the process. And I will say when that happens, when all of them want it and they sort of get in a bidding war, typically those shows get made. Not for sure getting on the air, but typically those shows get made. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Let me jump. Uh, I think it's a question that, that changes by the bus that goes by yeah. in some ways. And of course, that means in other ways it never changes. Though I think if you're talking about drama, now the networks, unless the show is on the air, uh, I mean, the, the eye of the needle has gotten a lot smaller for dramas in terms of like the classic ABC, NBC, CBS. It's just, uh, I mean, it's this particular year, so it may change, but certainly, uh, I mean, partly because of the writer's strike, less pilots were made, less shows were picked up, and I think that's partly because of that, but I think there's another thing going on which you can say is about reality shows, but it's about many things as well. Um, but let's talk for a minute with you all about sort of some of the beginnings of how you learned your lessons before you became showrunners. I mean, Damon, you have a pretty, you sort of went to several places before, uh, you know, before lost, before yeah. you got lost, to quote yourself. Um, uh, I started as an executive. Um, uh, before that, I was, uh, I worked at an agency first. I was an agent's assistant, sort of learned. Um, you know, what agencies were interested the in. The basis of Lost is obviously working at an agency. Yes, you know? of course. That it's was, all about a plane it, crash. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's dog eat dog. <laughs> and, uh, and then migrated over to, uh, to Paramount, working for an executive there, and then ultimately I worked um, as a creative executive for Alan Ladd Jr. on the feature side of things. 
And uh, I started working for him the week after he won the Oscar for Braveheart. And over the next three and a half years, he did not make a single movie because of the development process. And during that time, I became incredibly enamored of television because friends and colleagues that I had working in TV, in that three and a half year span where we made no movies, produced 75 hours of television. Mm -hmm. And uh, I began sort of jonesing for that experience. Um, and I quit my job to become a writer's assistant on a show called Wasteland, which was uh, Kevin Williamson's follow-up uh, to uh, Dawson's Creek. And um, I learned a tremendous amount in, in a very short period of time and basically became a writer on that show. And I wrote five, uh, four or five episodes of the 13 that were produced, only two of which ever aired. Mm -hmm. um, so it got canceled very quickly and at that time uh, I got uh, signed by uh, CAA and they the first meeting I took was with Carlton Cuse um, who actually now uh, we run Lost together but John um, was Carlton's mentor so there's a little bit of a you know um, Carlton was my mentor on, uh, on Nash Bridges and uh, now we're running the show together so essentially over the course of that year which was Nash Bridges last year I learned how to run a show by basically shadowing Carlton and John Worth, who were running the show together. Nash was shot in San Francisco, but written and post uh, and cast uh, basically out of LA and Burbank. So that was its last year. I learned a tremendous amount there. The show got canceled uh, because Don Johnson's a raving lunatic. And, uh, <laughs> so that was not a bad. There was, you know, I don't, I don't want to overuse this analogy, but if Lost is in some respects about an agency life. Uh, you could probably say that dealing with Don Johnson is uh, yes. has its own right. special warp. Yes, exactly, no doubt. And uh, and fortunately for that, um, I then I had come on and worked on a show in its sixth season, so I, I knew how a, a successful show uh, up and running was supposed to function. Now I said I'd love to have the experience of going to ground zero and seeing how a show in its first season can find its legs, because Wasteland obviously did, did not do that. So um, I got a job working with Tim Kring uh, on a show that he uh, wrote called Crossing Jordan, and I worked there for three seasons and basically learned, ag again, now how to uh, run a show from the ground up from him. So by the end of the third year, I was working very closely with him in terms of casting, posting, locking cuts, and all that stuff. And at that time, uh, I got a call from a friend of mine who was an executive ABC saying, would you like to meet J.J. Abrams? And that was the beginning of Lost. The, uh, I, years ago, when we were doing China Beach, there was an actor on a name Robert Ricardo, and he was asked what the secret of uh, getting a job on a series was. And he said, well, I've learned that the secret is to uh, dress like and look as much like the executive producer and showrunner as possible. <laughs> you look at Damon's history, maybe not those things, but ser seriously, you got to know significant players along your journey. I mean, that's, you know, or whether they were mentors, whether, but whatever, that's a, quite a list. Sure, and, you know, I, you know, the thing about J.J. is I'd been stalking him for, you know, close to two years, not like sitting outside his house with razor blades stalking, but, you know, <laughs> just sitting outside his house, primarily. <laughs> and, uh, and had been trying to get this meeting because I was a huge fan of Felicity and Alias, and then the timing just never quite worked out until, you know, the, um, I got that call and basically, he, he was producing a pilot called The Catch and still running Alias, and the lost idea was generated by the network, actually, Lloyd Braun, and they came to him and said, what can you do with this idea at the beginning of February, which is way beyond the traditional pilot development season, and JJ said, if you can put me with another writer, maybe I'll supervise it. So as a result of me telling everybody in the universe that I would be desperate to do anything with him, that information finally made that meeting occur, and I also had and, uh, you know, four years of television under my belt. So I think one thing that happens, and, and probably everyone on the um, up here has experience with is, they give shows to people who just write great pilots. And the first thing that happens is those people are either fired or they are, they are asked to partner with an experienced showrunner who they have no working experience with and are not deferential to. And it, it's, a, it's a recipe for fundamental disaster because the showrunner's like, you're not interested in learning about television for me. And the writer says, you're not interested in my vision. And then everything collapses. Chemistry. Uh, yeah, for, sometimes a forced marriage. Now, Kevin, you sort of are it's a little bit similarly. I mean, because you certainly uh, tracked a, a certain individual of some renown. I mean, I don't know exactly what you're, how you guys met, but this is Aaron Sorkin because Kevin worked on Sports Night as well as West Wing. Yeah, I, um, 
I actually was the third choice for Sports Night. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't um, they couldn't close the deals with the first two people, and I was an artist, and I think it was just sports, and they thought, well, let's get the guy from the, the cable show no one watched. And uh, <laughs> and I actually had a first meeting, and um, I remember it was the biggest meeting I've ever been in, because it, it was Imagine, if you remember, all these executive producers, and the only question I got was from Talami, Tommy Shalami asking me where I got my shirt. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm not getting that, that, that job. job. That question. <laughs> and um, I ended up, uh, because the other, they couldn't close the deal, I, I, I got the job there. And, and I remember people, writers saying, why do you want to take that job because you're not going to be, you're not going to be writing that much? Which was true, but I really, I loved Sports Night. I, I came on the second year, and I watched the first year, and I loved that show. It was the only show I wanted to go on. And I thought, well, if nothing else, you know, I'm going to be able to play from the blue tees and, and, and just hang out with these guys, not only Aaron, but John and, and Tommy, uh, when he took me to West Wing. So that's why I stuck with them. And I learned so much about storytelling and, and certainly producing from John and Tommy. And John Wells is, you know, amazing. So I was able to, to you know, garner that. And then Corman, in the interest of full disclosure, is my agent, managed to parlay that into an overall deal at Fox. And then um, I left uh, um, West Wing and, and suddenly was an executive producer with somebody else on, um, on Lion's Den. And, and that was being thrown into the deep end. Because that was, it was a different experience. Because then you're looking. I was just running the writer's room. On, on West Wing, and now y'all suddenly you were dealing with everything with casting and everything else. So, it was um, it was it was quite an education. Um, in, in terms of just I'm um, going a segue. Sometimes it'll be a little erratic, but going off of shows that are successful to shows that are not successful, like Lions Den. I mean, what was sure. Rose Point like? I mean, that it was sort of a I, fabulous I, experience I, in a in a. It was a way. great experience, but I will say that I'm the queen of the single season show. <laughs> um, I've never worked on a show that wasn't a first year show, so I've only worked on you know pilots. Then the show gets up and running, and I've never worked on a sh the longest running show I ever worked on was a show I co-created with Ken Levine and David Isaacs called Almost Perfect that ran 34 episodes. And I never felt like I was the kind of person that could um, bend my personality to imitate someone else's voice. I, I was actually scared that I couldn't do it, but, and I kept getting either pilots or jobs on another person's show. Uh, Gross Point was a, um, I love the show. It's, it's out on DVD now. And I'm not plugging it because I don't get any money off it anyway. Um, but, um, that show was created by Darren Starr, and I was good friends with Darren. I worked on it kind of unofficially all during pilot week because Darren and I had been social friends. We'd never worked together. So my plan was, I love the show. I'll work on it for free. I'll show him my wares. I'll show him what I can do when I'm like in a room. And then he hired me to be the executive producer with him. And um, he had Sex in the City and also a show called The Street on the Air at the time. So. Um, I don't know if you guys actually know what a showrunner does, but you're really responsible for making the sh sure the show gets done every week. So we were breaking the stories, um, casting, uh, editing, doing basically every aspect of the show, including making sure things were going well on the set. Um, and this was a single camera half hour, so it shoots just like a movie or a one hour show, rather than a sitcom that's on a, a sound stage. So we were shooting every day of the week with no hiatus. Um, and this particular show nearly killed me. I was very ambivalent when it got canceled. <laughs> a lot of people, if they're really honest, when a show gets canceled, they're devastated and relieved all in the same day. Um, There's a joke that every year you have a show on the air, you lose 10 points of IQ. You know, or every year you have a show on the air, your life is shortened by five years. Well, it's grueling, and and the metaphor that I use is like in that. I just realize I'm about to die, <laughs> <laughs> and, and very very stupidly. <laughs> but wealthy, yeah. <laughs> You're going to die rich. Uh, and I feel great, so if you want to give me you. some of your money, I'm, I'm good. Um, <laughs> the last part of this panel is to uh, write Damon's will. Yeah. Uh, what else can I say, though? But the show, um, the show really, what really nearly killed me was in the single camera half hour, you don't have any hiatuses. We had eight regulars, and we had a show within the show. 
So you had to come up with stories for the eight regulars that intersected somehow. I mean, I feel like I'm whining in front of Damon Lindelof, but um, this, they, they had to connect thematically. They had relationships with one another, and then it had to resonate with the show within the show. And we did 18 episodes. Uh, and there were kids, which even makes it, I, I imagine. No, there like, weren't. They were they all over 18. Know, but, but I'm not kids' kids, but like people who hadn't really done a lot before. Yeah, so. but you know what, uh, what was great about that? They were scared of us. I said, to, I said to Darren, if this thing comes back next year, they're all going to be such assholes. But because they were sort of still intimidated, that they were really great for that 18. They fought amongst themselves, but we acted like we didn't know that was going on. Um, we loved the show. The show. We just were like, you know, it's like let the kids work it out. If it gets really bloody, then we'll deal with it. Um, but the show, the network loved the show, we loved the show, it got great reviews, and no one watched the show. And I, I'm not sure why, uh, my theory is partly it wasn't really a kid's show, but it looked like a kid's show, so we didn't get the adult audience, and it was on, um, uh, it was on after Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and we literally began one of the episodes. It was all about, you know, this sort of horrible hijinks, behind the scenes of these actors who were on the teen show. And so one of the actors was caught with a prostitute. It, the whole episode was he was caught with a prostitute and then had to go to like Sex Addicts Anonymous to not go to jail. But the episode began with a salacious act on a side street in a Range Rover. And then it was like, Sabrina goes to college, and now this. <laughs> and so it, it really wasn't the right, you know, the right place. And, the show got canceled after 18 episodes. But it was, you know, the thing is, as you may hear from the people here, you know, the TV business is such a crapshoot, and you work so hard when you get something on your, you know, your, your health, your life, your friends, your family. Eventually, you don't have time for any of it, so you really better hope there's something you love about it. The people you work with, the subject matter, or it's really, really, really depressing. You know, it's inter it's interesting. Also, the, the you know the showrunner thing from an agent's perspective is 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 so critical. Not just if you're involved with the showrunner who's created the show, but I've dealt with all of these guys. Obviously, Kevin about staffing, and it's so important. And you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, to make sure you guys too surround yourselves mm -hmm. with the right people. And when the staffing season starts, not only are they running the show, they're running that staff and hiring those writers. Um, and I, from my perspective, again, I, you know, I've seen a lot of frustration from showrunners when perhaps the right writers aren't chosen. Oh, well we, we had, because there were only 18 episodes, it was for the WB, we had two teams and two individuals and me. And then I fired one of the teams. And we didn't have time to hire anyone else. It was literally like, oh, I can't, I didn't know a ringer, you know. And I couldn't hire anyone else. And that's also partly why I had a nervous breakdown. I went in the bathroom one day, you know, I was sitting in the room Oh, this isn't why you came here, but I'm sitting in the room and I'm spacing out and I'm thinking, Robin in oh, the bathroom, a oh my God, no, first I'm sitting in the room and I'm like spacing out and then all of a sudden I hear one of the writers go, Robin, what do you think? And I, and I look and these four faces are looking at me waiting to make a decision. So I'm like, I have to go to the bathroom. I go in there, hyperventilate, and if there had been a window, I would have just gone right out. It was like, I got to go back in. I have no choice. Now there is something, sort of, there's a joke, there's a, a rather successful producer named Peter Goober who once said to me, that, and I felt this, that when I first came here, it was all about the material. If you have some success, it really is about the boat that you're in with other people. That's equally important. And if the boat is, you know, if you're all rowing in the same direction, and as he said to me, well, forget about rowing in the same direction, it's when the guy's in the, you know, the stern of the boat with a jackhammer or a power saw, you know, going through the bottom of the boat and water's pouring in, and says, everything's great, you know, <laughs> then, you, you know. So it's very important, the personalities. I don't know. In terms of Damon, probably in a sense, Lost is tied not only to JJ but to Carlton in terms of the ability to work together. I would think that would be. Yeah, I mean to to follow the. Uh, I, I think I might be combining my 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 movies, but in the the Hitchcock movie uh, Lifeboat, I think there's like a Nazi in the boat with him too, <laughs> um, and you know, and sometimes that can happen because you know very often you know you're finding the show in the first season of the show, and if you don't have the sort of um, uh, the right mix of staff. There are people on your staff that you can hire that will continue to challenge, um, you know, things that you want to try. And experimentation is key. Uh, for Lost, basically, um, JJ very quickly migrated over to um, directing Mission Impossible Three. 
So I was running the show by myself for the first seven or eight epi- uh, seven episodes of the show. So we broke and, and everything was going through my typewriter and I was flying back and forth between Hawaii and you know my own bathroom story is I was driving on the 101 to work and I said, if I slam my car into the divider, how many days would I get off? <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't quite a suicidal thought, but at that point I realized you know, I was in trouble and uh, I had been calling Carlton all through the process of you know, essentially, you know, pardon my French, what the fuck do I do now? And he was a very sort of steady guiding hand and it very quickly got to the point where I said, please, will you come and, you know, and partner with me and help me run the show because I'm just completely overwhelmed. And, and he said yes. And uh, he came on as we were posting the fifth episode and writing the eighth episode. And then everything started to get quantifiably better because the big question that everybody was asking about the show was, are you making it up as go, you go along and do you know where the show is going to go? There was just no time in the first season to calibrate any of those things because you know, we basically shot the pilot, we wrapped on April 24th and then it got it, like three weeks later we were in New York and all these people are around us and then we started writing the series so there was no time to sit down and, and design this grand map so once Carlton came in you know uh, you know, a true partnership was born and then started to get some relief in terms of, you know, being able to take a breath because the thing is, as a showrunner, as everyone on this up here knows, the worst thing you can do is get behind because once you get behind, if you start working on the stuff that you feel like you've put over here, you're like Lucy and Ethel in that episode where they're like on the assembly line, you're just completely cooked. So you have to get the scripts down to Hawaii and then those things are sailing and you can move on to the next thing. But if you don't if you don't do that, then the script that you're working on now can't get worked on because you're dealing on the script that should be in Hawaii and you're answering actor problems and, and uh, it just becomes a disaster. And you know, the key, the real, you know, the real turning point loss in its first season was bringing Carlton in and, and the forging of that partnership um, in, in order to run the show in a more, more productive way because that was about to happen. Not to mention, we were, we were operating sort of, yeah, let those guys, let them do their Crazy Island show. We're not really paying attention to them. And then the show premiered and it did this big number, and we premiered like two weeks before Desperate Housewives did, which even which considerably eclipsed Lost as an even bigger number. But up until that time, ABC, you know, they'd been just doing shows that were one and out. So suddenly, all this attention was on us, um, you know, to not fuck up. And you know, when you're constantly surrounded by people saying, "Don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up," you're much more prone to fumble the ball. Yeah. Also, just as a, I, was Lloyd gone by then? Because yeah, Lloyd was gone. So the man who sort of was the one of the initial, what, uh, people that made, helped this show happen, of course, was gone from the network by then. Right. So the people who probably were there thereafter didn't necessarily have the same belief in the show or the people. That's You know, to Steve, uh, Steve McPherson was running Touchstone, um, so there was some continuity there. He took over the network and essentially, I'm not sure whether or not he got the show, but once he saw the testing, he got the show well enough to put it on the air and put a tremendous amount of, you know, this is the side of the bus sort of mentality that I think started that season, which was that, you know, Steve did outdoor advertising for Desperate Housewives and Lost. So everywhere you looked, you saw those two shows on the side of bus, driving down Sunset Boulevard. Like traditionally, that's not the way television shows were marketed. And he made them events and successfully launched those shows. So whether or not he got it creatively, at least he sold it. Yeah. Let me go to one of the things that happens, too, is the actual process of making a pilot. And Kevin, on West Wing, you were were you around when the pilot was made, or you came in there no, after? But but you know the after. story of what happened. Well, right? it was written before Sports Night, right? Right. And, and, but you probably. Well, you I was going to say, just in a, in a specific sense, when you make a pilot these days, it's not. There's you know you interact with the network, and it, it's now not at all unusual that a part of a pilot or a substantial part is rewritten or reshot uh, during the process or at a later date. It can be about recasting. In the case of West Wing. There was this uh, minor actor who appeared only in Act Four of the pilot, oh, right. uh, and who was seen as a guest star um, until I think the testing was, and that was a, a guy named Martin Sheen <laughs> on The West Wing. The as written in Aaron Wright's like plays, he didn't, in, a, in a play sense would be Act Three or Act Five. You suddenly have this guy who's talked about all along, and suddenly he appears. And when he appeared, it was beautifully done and very dramatic. Well, of course, the show then was tested, and guess who tested by far the highest. And I think originally, in early drafts, he wasn't even in the show. There was not going to be, you, never, you would never see the president. 
was all going to be in the West Wing and you dealt with all the players that were there. And then, I don't know if they got Martin. And, and the well, the, the, you know, the good news for Martin Sheen was his agents then said, whoa, you want us? Well, ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Mr. Sheen, uh, I think, signed a very nice contract. And, of course, the rest is seven years of history, I think. And that can happen. Now, Alan, I want to turn to you because, in a way, you're, to me, from what I know, a sort of, I would say, contemporary hybrid. You know, you're the, the one who's, uh, I mean, you're, you're, whether you're talking about Wonder Woman or you're talking about the comic world, which I think is very much evident in much of what is successful now. Um, and, you know, tell us a little about sort of how you, because if I look at your, his credits, I mean, it's sort of like, hey, I can do anything. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. so, I mean. He's the same person that did the OC, Sex and the City, now Grey's Anatomy, in addition to his comic life, so. Are you trying to sign him? Yeah. Uh, I, I, he, we, he used to, we, we used to work but together he, before I, uh, yeah. before you fired and him. And Alan and I met on uh, Party <laughs> of Five, the last season. Well, I feel like the last I season, where at one point these words were said, "Let's just leave the hospital set up. We'll use it next week." <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like I came in right at the end of the old school TV regime, where people didn't come from features to do television. You started at the bottom and you worked your way up and you learned your craft there. And uh, Chris and Amy, Chris Kaiser and Amy Lippman, who created Party of Five, were very. They had grown up on Sisters, and uh, uh, they. As a story editor coming in, I was a story editor my first year on Party 5, we were instructed and expected to do everything a showrunner does. We were expected to run the room when it was our episode, to be on set supervising production, to be in editing, to do music. We did every aspect of the experience and I got incredibly spoiled. Um, it was like going to film school. So. It, they they were very much in the tradition of we're you know we know how to do this and we want y we want you to know how to do this so you can help Al ease the burden. Alan, were they were they you know kind of there with you or they? That was the first year that they had stepped away. That was season five, and they had appointed a new showrunner, uh, John Romano, who did the best he could. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was it was a really rough transition for Kaiser and Lippmann at that point, and they they really empowered all of us to to run the show as a team. And, and that was an extraordinary experience. And then I got lucky in that, I think it's because I sort of know what my strengths are and what my interests are as a writer, and I do the relationship comic drama thing. And so all the shows that I've worked on have had similarly minded people behind them. So like I went to Sex and the City and it was the same thing there. Everybody there was an equal partner to a certain extent and, and was expected to do their share of the show running, and then the OC, which I, a job I got simply because of Mark Corman, um, Josh Schwartz was a 26-year-old who had written some pilots, one of which had gotten made. He'd sold a movie for a million dollars while he was in college and dropped out of college, but he had never, he had never run a show, and they were looking for showrunners, and I wasn't at the time. I was, at that point, I think I'd been supervising producer, and cons I, I had just come off Gilmore Girls as consulting producer <coughs> after being supervising producer on Sex and the City, and they weren't looking at people my level, and Mark said, you have to meet with him. And I met with Josh, totally not wanting to be on this program at all. A, a show about surfers in Orange County, and I'm a Jewish, gay, you know, hyper-intellectual, analytical person. Um, <laughs> so I, I was like, you don't want me on this program. And then I met Josh, who was even more Jewish and hyper-analytical <laughs> and nebishy than I was. And I was like, what are we doing? Let's, okay, let's, let's do go it. Surfing, yeah. He's like, no, you don't understand. It's about the only Jewish family in that community. I was like, let's write that show. <laughs> so, uh, so amazingly, we didn't have a showrunner for a long time. Like, they... They sort of let us hire Joe Doherty. Like we, I, I'd never run a show before outright. Josh certainly hadn't, but we were doing great. And then we hired this guy from 30 something and that didn't really work out, we let him go. And then we just, as, as happened with you, you just start doing it because you have to do it. And so we got about five episodes in before they hired a guy to come in from the outside, an older gentleman who had run Providence, I guess, a couple of years before. And then Bob De Laurentiis is his name and he came in and sort of did the production side of things, and then Josh and I basically co-wrote every episode. We did 27 episodes that year. So that was really my first, okay, you're, you're doing this all by yourselves without any help experience in show running, and that was miserable. That was absolutely miserable, and the greatest experience of my life that, uh, you know, up until that point. Um, so. I think one of the things is there are very different models for show running. I mean, sometimes it's 
there's a writer's room, and the, the writer of the individual script follows that script, whether it's about being on the set, whether it's in casting, whether it's in post-production. Uh, there are other shows where basically it's going to go to somebody's typewriter eventually. Um, I mean, I think if you're talking about West Wing in its first few years, I mean, it's... Uh, Aaron was going to be... Aaron's a, a little bit like David Kelly, that he wouldn't necessarily be in the room, even for the, the, the story meetings. Um, there'd be memos sort of flying around, and at some point, Aaron was, if literally or figuratively in a hotel room, would disappear for X amount of time, and something similar or dissimilar would appear out of, you know, under the door, or out the, you know. Right, he would, we, we broke stories and broke them into acts and actually laid them on the table, and then he would take an act a day and, and do the, his, write the music. And, uh, and, and sometimes we would, a few of us were, he trusted enough to write scripts, uh, but they always, and he, you know, he'd, he'd apologize to it. He'd just say, I, I have to, I have to do it. It has to go through me. And so um, I respect that. It's a show. In other shows, the scripts are, let's say, I, mean, I know um, on shows that I've done, I try to get to a point where you're not rewriting or rewriting as little as possible, which, of course, is an act of sanity, um, but that you, the note process is intense and immense, that you're trying to, get people back in the room to, to get the script to where you and they want it, for that matter. But there's very different models. I mean, do you, do you all basically now, or certainly originally, you, everything was sort of coming back to you or to you and Carlton? Yeah, I mean, but the nature of the show, even from the very beginning, has been a lot of writing gets done in the room, and that's really exciting for us. You know, the, the, the majority of our days are spent, you know, in the room no matter what's going on so we're floating over to post and and looking at casting tapes and all that kind of stuff but basically like you know between 11 and 1 in the morning and then between sort of like 3 and 6 in the afternoon we're in the room because the re because the show is so heavily serialized and you're often talking about stuff that's going to happen seven episodes from now that you're working towards and everybody needs to be on the same page we literally on on our whiteboards scene by scene will riff through an episode and throw out dialogue and, and toss out jokes. And so it's really, uh, it, it, it feels like it's a lot more like a sitcom room in the way that Lost is um, written. And then be because we can spare, you know, uh, so few writers, then we peel off. So we'll say basically, all right, Eddie uh, Kitsis and Adam Horowitz, this is going to be your episode. It's a Hurley episode. You're on point in this episode. So when we're out of the room, you're keeping it rolling, but we come back in. And then they go off. They write their outline. We notes the outline. But then you, you've moved on to the next script in the room. So there's this sort of the writers are writing their drafts. And um, the more work we do in the room, as you say, the less rewriting is necessary because we already feel there's a sense of sort of collaborate, uh, collaborative ownership. So, you know, I feel like Carlton and I get a tremendous amount of credit for the writing of the show, but the reality is, is every single script is not gangbang, but it is group written, and then the, the draft writer of that show, is, it's very close to their original writing. Like, but, you know, but it would be fair to say that it took you guys a while to find that, that group, that rhythm. Absolutely. I mean, and I think uh, the, the first season of any show, the retention rate of the staff has got to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. Because you're finding the show, you're finding the best voices for the show, you're finding you know, the style of the show, and you're also, it's, it is who's in the boat with you. At the end of the day, you're spending 14 hours a day with these other people, and they just have to be people that you want to hang out with. The people that you want to hang out with factor far trumps the talent factor. Like, we've had enormously talented writers on the show who, who just, for whatever reason, were unhappy working that environment or, you know, uh, you know, there were personality conflicts or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, you're, if you're not helping, then you're hurting. And that's, that's all there is to it. And you as a showrunner are sort of finding, like, what is it, you know, what is it that I'm interested in and in bringing into the show? Because you're building a team. You don't need four fastball pitchers. You need, you know, you need, uh, you know, a, a starting pitcher and then a middle relief. And so you're finding people who complement each other as well. I think the one of the practical uh, messages in this is that it's not only obviously about your talent. It's about the energy that you bring once you're hired. I mean, it's so it's about the chemistry, the compatibility, and that that doesn't mean you shouldn't be yourself, but you just have to know. That uh, I mean, let's talk a little about trying to. I mean, how does Gray's Anatomy work? And in terms of, if anyone wants to talk about originally hiring a staff, because that is a that is a difficult process. Well, Shonda, I came on at the end of season two, and uh, Shonda had never done television before. She'd been a feature writer um, exclusively, and she 
again, the retention rate in terms of the people who were actually doing the writing those first two seasons, there were two people who were, do, who were seeing their work on screen, but everybody was writing drafts that would get thrown out because the show was finding itself. But she didn't know she could fire people, like no one had told her she could fire people. So um, the staff stayed the same for about two years. Um, and she wasn't running the room. It was a very oddly run show in that ABC had partnered her with somebody who's extremely talented and wonderful and really got the show working and staffed it. And he kind of sheltered Shonda so that she could go off in her office and be alone and write the show. And then he would sort of give her, you know, in the Aaron model, you know, here's what we worked on. And she would read this stuff and go, no, this isn't it at all. I got to keep working. I got to keep working. I got to rewrite it. So it was a nightmarish situation for her who was getting unusable drafts and for the staff who were writing and writing and writing and writing and not seeing a word appear on screen. So finally, after about two seasons, that showrunner, Jim Perriott, who's extremely talented, but I think they both realized it wasn't working, and he went off and did um, another show. And uh, one of the writers on staff, Krista Vernoff, who'd started as a supervising producer, had Shonda's voice down. And so Shonda and Krista were doing all the writing for seasons, I would say mo most of the writing for seasons one and two. Um, in season two, they, are they were actually able to bring on a couple of new writers who, who did really well in that environment. But I think as of the beginning of season three, there's only one writer left from season one, like one. So uh, two, there are two. So what we do now, it's a much more functional room. It's a very much a, a, about who Shonda feels safe with and who she wants to hang out with and whose writing she actually respects and whose voice she admires in the room. She loves to be challenged. She loves to be um, argued with. Um, but we all sort of know in the end it's going to be her, it's going to be her executive decision what happens to these people. She doesn't want to rewrite us. She doesn't want to have to do it. She's got two shows now, so the people who are there are people who can give her drafts that we can then, you know, shoot. Um, so what we do is we are in the room six or seven hours a day. We take turns running that room depending on whose episode it is. Shonda comes in maybe twice a day, once in the morning, once uh, very late in the day. Maybe she stays 20 minutes and says yes, yes, no no, yes, no, and then comes back at the end and does the same thing. Um, and then she reads every outline, she gives notes, she reads every draft and gives notes. And once you're sort of out of the room, um, you have sort of a more one-on-one -on -one relationship with her in terms of the development of your script, and it gets done very quickly. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's the best staff I've ever been on. There's no politicking, there's no vying for position because everybody has the same responsibilities regardless of your title. Um, so, and it's a, you know, it's a great show to be on, so everybody's sort of content. And their writing is making it to the screen. She's gotten to the point now in season five where you don't have people on staff who can't deliver in all the areas that she needs them to. Does that you know, answer the question? Yeah, Kevin, talk about just Journeyman, because the, the, that is a show that you created and executive produced, and, uh, you know, hiring a staff, trying to put it together. Um, Obviously, a, a conceptual show in terms of, of, of what it was, and how much even was was Alex important to the Very development of the show? Talk a little about that, because that becomes not only about writing, it becomes about making a show. Damon was right about that. You, you want to have, you don't want to hire a bunch of fastball pitchers. Everyone has their strengths. There's a couple of guys who were good in sci-fi. Some were good in relationships. One I I knew wasn't a great draft writer necessarily, but was really good in the room. And all of them. Most of them I had worked with, half of them I had worked with, and the other half just gave really good meetings. And it, it can never be, uh, you can't underestimate how important it is to have chemistry. Because it really is, not even a boat, it's a submarine. I mean, you really <laughs> go <laughs> underneath, <laughs> and there's no getting out. And you're hanging with these people. And the thing that I really wanted, and um, I owe Aaron my career, but I, I, would, <coughs> I really wanted the, the writers to feel <coughs> invested in the show. And to really feel like they're contributing. And I tried really hard. And I, it was probably a mistake uh, to try to get uh, uh, even the staff writers a, a credit on, on, on one of the scripts in the first 12. Because I tell you, if, if they feel invested and they feel it's like their show, and I, sometimes I just said, let's go to post and you know, look at your show. And, and they came to every casting session. They live for the show. They be, <coughs> and, and, and that shows in, in how they work and how late they work. And, we had a we had a the best room I had ever been involved with, and uh, uh, they're very talented people, and and um, it would have been I don't if we would have been fortunate to come back, you know I would have been difficult to replace any of them. But, 
Talk a little about the, the process of making a pilot in terms of working with a director. Yes. Um, Alex Graves, who John and I worked with, Alex was executive producer on the West Wing, very, very talented director, worked on Sports Night and did the, the pilot, not only to, to my show, but also to the Nine. He's the pilot, director of the Fringe, JJ's. <coughs> um, he's extremely tough, extremely passionate. I remember saying to Mark, there was another director that the network wanted. I said, well, he's great. I love him, but I really want Alex. I really want Alex. And just because if there's ever a person that's more passionate than you, it would be, be Alex, to the point where sometimes we'd, we'd bump heads. But um, he brought that to the screen. He brought, he, he's not only good with the way the show looks, he bring, actors love him. He brings out the, the best in performance. And with him, you know, in, in television, the, the writer is seen as the king. All that's starting to change now as you get to get directing partners. I like a real strong director partner and also want him to feel invested uh, in the show and to know that, you know, if we were going to do press or go anywhere, it was always going to be, you know, our show. And, and that helped deliver it. And my, my show originally was cast contingent. And um, um, I wanted, I, I, I showed it to Alex and we had dinner and, he, and I thought he was just going to go, let me think about it. He goes, I want to do this. And the minute you have a strong director like Alex, they lift the contingency. And because Alex was involved, <laughs> Kevin McKidd wanted to do it. And we started to, um, to gain some momentum. But um, there, um, th that director is, is very key, or that element that you can attach to it, if you can, um, can go a long way to getting you on the air. Let me go back a second, just to, for you all, and, and respond individually. If, if you're hiring a staff, uh, sort of rate the difference, you know, the importance of the writing on the page or the meeting, because you mentioned meetings, for example, just because I think it helps, again, to say, how important the writing is and how you have to keep doing it, but at the same time, boy, it is about chemistry. Well, so writing gets you in the room. Yeah. Yeah, gets you in that's the room. exactly right. I mean, in, in, uh, in TV, it, the resume is sort of inconsequential. It's like, you know, if, if so, you look at someone's credits and go, do these credits sort of add up to, the sh to, the, to our show? That's one way of looking at it, but I think it's very flawed. I mean, if you look at Lost, like, what is it about my credits? Wasteland, Nash Bridge is Crossing Jordan that equal Lost. Or, you know, so at the end of the day, you can't, you, you can't really judge what a writer's true voice is. Sometimes someone coming off of procedural dramas is most inclined to really want to do your show because they feel so hedged in. So at the end of the day, their sample gets the meeting. And, you know, personally, you know, Carlton um, taught me this, and I agree with it 100%. You want to read something original. Like, for me to see, this is my spec West, West Wing, is like, okay, so you wrote a West Wing and did a great job of imitating Aaron Sorkin's voice, but we're really curious about your voice because our show is always constantly trying to reinvent itself and feel fresh and sound new, and the minute that it starts to feel like we're doing the same stuff over and over again, it's not interesting. So you read a sample, some, some people write one-act play, or original pilots, that gets them the meeting. So you know that th th they're a good writer before you even have that meeting. And then it's just all about, you know, how great uh, is this 40 minutes that I spend with this person in terms of what, what our vibe is. And it's weird because it's like speed dating. You're literally saying, after a 40 minute meeting, I'm going to commit to the next, you know, potential, at the very least, probably like 13 episodes of spending time with this person and trusting them and you know filling them in on all the secrets of the show and the, you cannot call an agent and basically say we're going to need a second meeting you know that's you know that's all you get well one of the things that when you're reading scripts and especially as the market tightens up and there's fewer scripted shows you know, there's a, a certain level of desperation from the agents. So you're getting these calls and people are sending literally stacks of scripts like this. And what's difficult is the vast majority, when they've gone through the process of having to get an agent, um, most of the scripts are good. And I would say the same percentage are terrible and great. You know, really unreadable or really connect and like one day I remember I was reading scripts for Gross Point and it was a Memorial Day weekend and by then I'd figured out that Darren Starr wasn't actually reading any of the spec <laughs> scripts so I had to like go through them all and I had this stack and I was just determined to get through them and by the way I would only read five pages if I wasn't into it five pages over there you can have a stack of over what several hundred if you're not yeah. careful well I had I would call the agents and say only send one client but when, then they would send e a bunch of agents from the same agency would send one client. But I said, well, target who you think would actually be good for this show. 
and then I'll, you know, and then I'll read them. But anyway, I'm reading these scripts. I really felt like I was so tired. And I was just like, I felt bad. I'm not giving these people their due because I'm too tired. Then I read a script I like, I'm awake. And it's very, um, you, it's hard to put your finger on because you're getting things that are competent. And everything sort of looks okay, but it's just not jumping off the page. I do like to read original material. Sometimes I'll read, like one of the guys I hired, never heard of him. He'd written a Seinfeld. I read his writer's draft. Uh, that was, he was a writer's assistant on Seinfeld who got a couple produced episodes. And then he wrote this spec pilot that was very weird, but I really thought it was good. Um, then you have the meeting. The other thing I always do is check people out. Because when you get a script, you don't know, did 50 friends help them write it? Um, what process did it go through to get to me? So generally I'll read the script. If I like the script, I'll have a meeting. Um, if you ever get a meeting on a new show, don't bullshit this, but if you genuinely like the show, spend five minutes at the beginning of the meeting specifically picking out things that you like. That will make the showrunner or the creator of the show happy. <laughs> and and also don't you know tell them this is what you should have done differently <laughs> that will make them mad um, I like it when people come in with ideas but not in a p pushy way so it's like oh I love this have you ever thought of doing that with them or whatever for me a good meeting is when I like the person and the energy feels good but also when I feel like I'm already working so if they bring me an idea that's kind of stimulating and I find myself kind of talking back and forth with that person, that person will have a really good chance of getting the job. Then if the person's worked with anyone else, I call and, you know, are they psycho? Do they give a good meaning and then come in and whatever, you know, powder? You know, do they take notes? You know, you really have to have somebody who's willing to... Um, uh, stand up for their ideas only to a point, and but be very sensitive if it's just not going, move on. You know, it, it's interesting as an agent when people give us spec material for staffing, uh, it, it's so it's so right that because it's so competitive now that I hate to say it, but it's like your teaser better be fantastic because if it's not, your script's not going to, it's not going to go any farther than that. And it, it's a fine line to walk because you don't want to be, have a script that's so sensationalized at the beginning that it almost feel silly, but you have to get somebody's attention at the beginning. Um, I, I'm, I've never been the kind of guy, and I've, I've staffed with Alan, I've staffed with Kevin, I've staffed with Damon and Ashley and Emily's, we wouldn't remember if we right. staffed on that. And I think it's really ineffective to be at a, in an environment where you're sending 75 scripts. Um, it's just not fair to the showrunner. But if you send three to five scripts that you believe in and you can actually articulate what it is they're about and why you're sending them, it actually makes a difference. It has, in my experience, with everybody at this table. Um, but those scripts have got to catch somebody's attention immediately. And, and, it, and it, it doesn't have to be, excuse me, Mark, but it doesn't, sen the sensational thing won't even no, that's what I'm grab saying. me. It, exactly. It just it's, has to be. It's like something about the character makes me curious what's going to happen. Right, and I'm not saying like Sorry. somebody jumps yeah. off a building. Yeah. I just, it's just got to be terrific from the beginning. It, and it, it, it sort of goes without saying that it has to be terrific at the beginning. It has to be terrific all the way through. But it makes a big difference, that teaser. <laughs> Um, it really, really does. At you, first five pages. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, if you're if you're thinking about us with a stack of say fifty to hundred scripts on our desk, the scripts that rise to the top, obviously the agents are going to be very aggressive, but they have a vested interest, and in that is to get their client a job. But if I get a call from Alan or Kevin or Robin, basically saying there's a script in that pile from someone who worked with me, they've asked me to call on their behalf, and I got to be honest with you, it's worth a read then bam, goes right to the top. Right. And you know, because I know that they're, they've got no vested interest whatsoever. They're not gonna get 10% and personally, you know, if I call Kevin and say, will you take this meeting as a personal favor to me, if he reads the script and it's a shitty script, the next time I ask him to do that, that script is gonna stay exactly where it was in the pile because, you know, so again, if you have prior work experience or you've earned any goodwill with any people who know the person you're about to interview with, that is that is a critical call that will get you in the room, I think. One of the things I used to do, just a little different, is I thought that the teaser can become, 
you know, again, it, it can be provocative. So I would always go as well to the middle of the script and just read like three pages. And within that space, I could tell if the teaser is good, well, guess what? It's still in character here in the middle. And sometimes the last three pages, because it is true, as awful as it is, you're not going to be reading every page of all these scripts. It just, you can't do it. I mean, you're, you're, you know, then, you're like out, then you're out the window the in the thing. bathroom. Yeah. You talked about that Sunday thing, because I always tell uh, new writers that the thing that should always be writing for, it's not so much like what it's going to look like on television. I always think of that executive, you're the last script on the pile. Yeah. And sh it's 11 o'clock, and they have to get up early, and, they're, and the first thing they're probably doing is looking to see how long it is. They're going yeah. right to the end. So you're thinking, just think of yourself always as, as you might be that person. So beyond what you say about the teasers, it's, it's having a voice and making sure that you're you're going to be entertaining, and the, and the writing has to be strong, and certainly if not the teaser throughout, but it's I mean, always that person. I, I personally respond to stuff that feels real. It not Whether or not it's true, it has to feel real, and it's the kind of stuff for me personally that if you were having lunch with someone and you said, you know, something like, I really shouldn't be telling you this, you know, then I'm interested. If there's something kind of juicy or real or I, kind of, I relate to that person, I'm writing a pilot right now, that it has been very challenging for me because it's a, um, an ensemble show about 20, you know, mid-20s performers trying to make it in, in New York. You know, honestly, who gives a shit about those people, right? So I've had to, I'm serious, this is like really challenging because it's kind of interesting on a reality show, you know, we all watch American Idol or there's something about these aspirational people, but I've had to literally find moments that at least make me like the person, relate to the person, um, but I've had to be very conscious about doing that because otherwise, I mean, I may have not done it successfully, but I'm trying to do that. Because otherwise somebody's reading this and going, who cares, you know? Anyway, I think if you were to take, if you're like a, a menu, and obviously it's, they're all a little different, of what would be helpful to getting a job? Obviously, I think in a way, if you had in your quiver a spec script of an existing show that you happen to love, and then you have this original piece also, so you can sort of lay them down. See, I can do that, but by the way, I have a voice. Then, of course, having an agent and an agent who believes in you is, there's no disputing. It's, no, it makes 100%. A you know? and, and the, the other thing, of course, then is what, I guess the word in, in The Great Gatsby would be, what, what's his name, it says connection. He starts it with a G. <laughs> Connections are not bad to have. You know, it's, you're banging on doors, and if you know someone inside the door uh, who can, you know, who, because you've been recommended by somebody else or because you know them, it is, it's invaluable. It's just that shorthand that moves something to the top of the pile. And I, I think for material, um, and you guys know much more than I, but we would always encourage people absolutely to write something original, possibly shorter as opposed to longer. Uh, you know, it's, yep. it's very difficult to get a showrunner to read a two-hour feature, but a one-act play, a short story, certainly a pilot, but something that could be digested quickly and, and it's, it's fun and it's just, you know, something that people are going to want to finish if they love it. And, and if it's 120 pages, it just makes the task more difficult. Just a thought. Now, I want to talk, talk to me, one and all, uh, about a show that's been picked up. It's now going on the air. It has an order of 13 or 22 or 24 or 25. And what the process is, not only of hiring people, but now you're in a room. Or Is it, do you all try and do several days? Do you try and take a retreat and have, you know, plan the season? Or what is your technique for sort of getting legs to a show? Well, I didn't take anybody to Hawaii like John No, Wilson. well, that's a different that's era. That's great. Yeah. But you know, it's like a, they say in, in professional football that Super Bowls are won in August. And I always feel like those first two, ten days are so key. And the kind of jump you get off on. I, I like to think globally for a season, so don't get to the end of it. But the idea is that you're kind of like a planet flag that you might be running to. And just make sure you get off to a, a good start and, uh, and how you break stories and you have one eye on that production calendar because you know that once that beast starts devouring pages, then uh, then there's then you're then you can be really in trouble. So I, I just try to get off to a real, real fast start in the room. We, um, you know, uh, along the sports analogy, we do this writers mini camp at the end of every season. So basically, there and it happened this year as a result of the strike. This year it wasn't supposed to happen because we're only producing 16 episodes a year now, so it makes it more manageable. But essentially, what happens is we finish writing the season finale, 
then um, then Carlton and I go into post mode and lock basically the episodes leading up to the finale, including the finale. And as that's going on, we we immediately start the writers for the following season of the show. So they get a week off between we've just broken the finale, now we go off, we write the finale, they get a week off, and then they come back. We start talking about the fifth season, while the fourth season is still very fresh in our heads. And we do that for three weeks, just in the mornings. Then we take a month off, you know, an actual hiatus, once the finale is locked, and then everybody comes back, and you start writing the fifth season of the show. So just like um, Kevin said, it's, that's where, it's those three weeks, you know, the key is to just be decisive. You just have to say, we're going to do this, we're not going to do this. Like, there's blue sky ideas, but that's the period where it's, you're not writing yet. You can actually sort of throw everything up against the wall and see what sticks. But when we come back in July and start writing the show, we're like, this is what we're doing. And that's the key, because if you sort of function in a space of maybe we'll do this, I'm not sure if we want to do that, let's see how this lands, it's it's when you're sort of, you know, scratching but, your head. But that, let me ask you, was it is it... True that playing too much. What's the game called? Gallica. That in the beginning of <laughs> yes, had an effect on season three. There's a rumor that you know that might have had a, yes, a bearing on the sort of dip or the, the you know um, emotionally. You know, season three, the start of season three was by far the weakest point in the history of the show, and a couple things were going on. The first was you know we were very um, downtrodden about the fact that the show was not going to get to end. We as writers were beginning to realize these flashbacks are going to go on forever. We can't answer any of the mysteries that the audience or we really care about because you have to keep people tuning in. And if you tell them these answers, they're not going to be interested anymore. And everyone has been saying to us, including our own representatives, it's just not the, the, the show. Too many people are watching the show to announce its end point at this point. It's just not going to happen. So we're, we felt like we were locked in cages, so we put Jack and Kate and Sawyer in cages for nine episodes. You know, They couldn't get out, and the show became, was in a rut. And ironically, although this was not like, we'll show him, but that's just how we felt, we started checking out of the show. And you know, we have this machine in our uh, writer's office that is like all the great 80s arcade games, and we became obsessed with Galaga. So we would play Galaga for like three hours and not write the show, because it was like, ah, screw it. Kate and Sawyer kiss in a cage. Like, That'll be an episode. Like, but it took it took the network and the studio and the audience seeing those episodes and saying, "This is the ghost of the future." You know, um, this is what the show will become if you do not announce an end date. It took them sort of seeing that to proactively begin to have these conversations about what if we did end the show? When could the show end? Is there a, a viable financial model where the show is still profitable? How many more episodes is that? We only want to do, you know. Um, two more seasons, they want three. Well, is there a way to do 16, 16, and 16 so they get their 48? All those conversations started happening. Then, you know, right around the time that the show was on hiatus and we were at our lowest point creatively, Steve McPherson basically said, I will deliver unto you the end of the show and this is what it's going to be and I'm going to allow you to announce it. Once that happened, we felt like, you know, that was the last time I played Galaga. You know, so uh, now I'm hooked on Puyan, which is uh, much shorter, but you're a pig with a bow and arrow. And, you know, but, but uh, suffice to say, you know, we felt... David has to leave early. Today yes, exactly. To we felt creatively liberated and, uh, you know, we, we, we were re-energized in the writing. And since then, I feel like the show has, you know, been on a hot streak, largely because we're working towards something as opposed to, you know, and, and I'm sure it would be very interesting to hear someone like Alan talk about this because sometimes you, you read in TV Guide, Patrick Dempsey is grumbling about, you know, I just want to, I just want to be in a, in a, in stasis in this relationship. I either want to be broken up with Meredith or, or, or I want to be with her. But they don't, the actors don't realize that this is television. It's about the continuing condition of, you know, life. So it, it's finding, rep, you know, it's presenting repetition in the most original way that you know how. Um, and that's incredibly difficult. It's a very slippery slope. Well, do you guys ever talk about Walker Percy? What's that? Walker Percy. Oh, right. well, that's, you know, I mean. Because he uses time. that. Rep yeah. he does. Uh, but, but tell me about Grey's Anatomy, just because, again, what's the process like at the end of a season or, you know, in terms of the, the next one coming? It's, is it similar to this? Or yeah, I mean, it is similar. We, we. By the way, these are all high class problems because the percentage of shows that exist beyond the first season Thank you. Is, is 15% maybe? For me, it's obviously 3%, but yeah. <laughs> that's You're special. I want, to, I want to know one second now, is that the secret all along, I've been trying to make a show good. So the idea to get a back nine is to secretly try to kill it. 
Is that, is that how you do it? <laughs> it's, it's, two, it's two things. It's, I'll remember it's, that next time. It's suicidal thoughts mixed with shirt selection. <laughs> that's the key. Because that was, you know, I walked in and JJ said, where'd you get that shirt? So that's, there, is, there is a commonality. Okay. Good, I'm going to take notes. <laughs> so, no, there seem to be, well, there are two things on the table. One is we, season five, the, the new season, it's very weird because we, because of the strike, we don't have the luxury of let's take a week, let's take two weeks to talk about what we want season five to be. We did this thing this year where we don't have any time off. We finish season four, we finish shooting season four at 4 a.m. on Sunday. Shonda was in locked up in post until Thursday and we got her yesterday to, talk, to start talking about season five. We start shooting in less than four weeks. So we have no time. So she did this thing where we all had to write anonymous, what do you hate about Grey's Anatomy? What do you want to happen on Grey's Anatomy? You know, what would you change if you could on Grey's Anatomy? And no names attached, and everybody, you know, everybody oh, cool. turns it in. Turns well, it's it such in. a, it's so, it's such nonsense, because I knew writing mine, like, two words in, she'd know, Alan, <laughs> you know? So I, like, I tricked it out, I tricked it out with, like, a font that I wouldn't normally use. <laughs> no, she knew two words in. So she reads them aloud, you know, in sort of, like, half disgust and half, okay, that's not a bad idea, we'll do that. That's all the prep we had, so, and we're, you know, like, Patrick and Ellen and all the actors, they feel really at liberty to complain about us ad nauseum in the press and if we did that about them oh, oh my goodness I mean and I love them I do and I have I have really satisfying relationship with them at work but I wish I could say and sometimes I do you guys this we're a team we're on the same team you can't I know you want to distance yourself from the crappy writing you think is going on on this television show but the actors just don't understand how the show works and a lot of that I think is the disenfranchisement a lot of actors feel the more enfranchised you can make your staff feel including your crew including your actors the more part of the process you can make them feel the better off your life is going to be on a show everybody's going to work harder it's exactly as Kevin said so um, yes that that's how we've prepared for season five this time and a lot of it has been listening to Patrick complain in the press and on set when he when we're a captive audience about what isn't <laughs> working and Shonda to her credit listens to the criticisms and says very much as as you just did yeah season three was about me feeling trapped in my own life and wanting to kill Meredith Grey which she did I mean one day she had a fight with Ellen on set and she walked into the writer's room and wrote under episode like 17 Meredith dies and we were all like, um, <laughs> joke, right? No, she killed Meredith Grey, and it wasn't really until the very last moment. I mean, she brought another Grey onto the show that season, so it could be Lexi Grey's Anatomy we were watching. Um, and, it, it, you know, it was her frustration. You really have no life. You have no outlet. You have no escape. There's no escape. ABC had come to us and said, well, you're ER. We want another 10 seasons from you. So you better figure out a way to start repopulating that hospital right away. And uh, create another show while you're and at it. And create another show yeah. while you're at it. Hey, Alan, when you, when you said you're, you're really only getting four weeks of prep this time, what's typical for you guys prep-wise? Like, how many weeks, certainly you'd want as many as you can get, but what, what's usual? Like because I know for you it was like, you had like six or eight. We usually weeks. had six. But now this isn't even four weeks of prep. This is four weeks until you start shooting. That's, so uh, we've got to have, that's no prep. That's a day of prep, and we better start breaking episode. One, you know, right one now. of the differences is when a show sometimes gets picked up at the last minute, you have no time to plan. One of the advantages is maybe lost because they now know have time to plan. The other thing, though, of course, is that a full season is like a marathon, and so everything tends to start breaking down by episode 18 or so. It's uh, you know, you're sort of liberated, you sort of collapse and panic and die, and then you're sort of reborn for the last couple. Maybe because you thought about the end of the season ahead of time. But there's a moment in there when you just... You can think you've got it all, like, all sorted. Sex and the City was a really unique experience in that we had sort of almost two months to plan the entire 18-episode season. We have stuff, and we knew what was going to happen to Carrie and those girls in every episode before we even wrote the first script. But that's the only time where... And we were only it's doing HBO 18, too. so... HBO. Yeah. So we had the luxury of coming back to L.A. for two months, plotting... 18 episodes and then going to New York and writing as fast as we could. But I, I know, for example, this year on Desperate Housewives, um, they did an ending, which I guess was rather surprising. And uh, Has it aired yet? Tell us yet. It's coming on the same. It yeah. reached the network, and the network rejected it. And so this past Tuesday, they reshot a whole new ending. So you can see that um, there's not a lot of time between the shooting and the air, you know, um, which can happen on these shows, whether they're successful or not. Now, 
Some shows are very, are disgustingly well run. ER is an example uh, in the sense that they usually shoot the first two, three, four episodes of the next season, you know, continuous with the end of the past season. Bless you. Um, Which is always tricky from an agent's perspective because you're not sure who's coming and who's going. Right. <laughs> and Yeah. But they, they do do that. Yes. And, that, of course, it helps to, you know, have a sense in, in the case of ER for a while it was like a five-year pickup. So it's, uh, you know, it's not all bad. <laughs> Um, is it coming back next year? <laughs> yes, last, one, one last, season. last yeah. season. Yeah, um, and I think the marathon. We'll finally, find out what the hospital is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, God, they announced it's an on end the date. island. Yeah, exactly. it's, a, it's a mystery. <laughs> well, no, actually, they discovered that you know there's that they just finally discovered there's no one left in Chicago that hasn't come through those doors and been killed or the, you know bus crashes or helicopters or whatever. There's no one left. Um, well, you know, one of the things I think we can do, I don't know if you all have questions, uh, but I think I'd like to throw it open to you all and, and see what someone has to say. First hand up. Um, for the mic. I guess as uh, kind of showrunners and agents and guys who read a lot, um, what is more important to you from a new writer? Like story or dialogue? Like what, what kind of captures you first, typically? Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, dialogue is so boring if there's not a good story. Yeah. And the story should come out of character. <laughs> so you really need good characters to tell the story, and the dialogue has to be good but in service of the story. Can I say something about specs? I appreciate the, the spec because it shows a certain command of craft, because television is specifically a craft different from other other forms of dramatic storytelling. Um, but I, most of the specs I read are... are basically about people who want a job like they're they're scripts that exist because that person wants a job they don't exist because that person has a story they have to tell mm -hmm. so if you've got I, I appreciate the value of a great of a great episode of you know if I were writing a spec right now I'd write Friday Night Lights because I'm obsessed with it and I'm obsessed with those characters and I would try to come up with a Friday Night Lights story that I feel has to be told that no one else could tell and that spec if it's invested with with story and character and dialogue and a love of that show, I'm gonna freaking love that writer. So I don't. I, I just wanted to not write off the idea that you can't write a spec that's gonna get somebody's attention. You, I've fallen in love with writers because of a spec. So that just as a side note, um, but it is. I think story is the hardest thing. I've been in a lot of writers' rooms and I've worked with a lot of incredibly talented people. And people who could actually, who are actually great pure storytellers, are really rare. So, but it all comes and out of And it's not plot. Around. It's not, you don't say plot tellers. Right. They're telling you a story. Why are we hearing this story about these characters at this moment in time? Why do they deserve my attention? Why is it important that I sit down and spend my life reading the script? If you can't answer those questions about whatever it is you're writing, if I can't answer those questions about episode five of Grey's Anatomy, there's no, nobody's watching. Just in the, in the history, you know, there, there's the, what's the, the oldest profession is prostitution? Well, someone said the oldest, profession is actually storytelling. And if you go back to like around the fire, if something, it's what, sort of what Robin said, it, it makes, you know, it's something uh, that makes you sort of sit up and pay attention or lean closer to the fire, that, that's pretty important. If actresses want to win an Oscar, that's when the storytelling and the prostitution intersect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I Hello. Um, my question is, uh, and maybe Mark can address this or whomever, what are the specs, uh, the hot specs, so to speak, what are people writing uh, that you guys are finding coming across your desk over and over and over again? And are you tired of reading those scripts? Yeah, be careful. Yeah. Yeah. I'll pay any of you to write a journeyman. <laughs> 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 I see that uh, you know, there, there, it... it Lately, there hasn't been any one particular show. Um, you know, people are writing Heroes. Um, there's always people writing House. Um, it's tricky. Um, Lost, but the, it, the great shows are, are sometimes very difficult to really be able to find your own voice within that voice. I mean, it's, it's when people try to mimic, in my opinion, those shows, unless they're going to be great, they seem not so good. And so, also, there are you guys know, again, more than I, there, there are certain showrunners who won't read certain shows. You know, clearly, you're not going to send him a spec lost. It's just not going to happen. That's a mistake. Um, 
So, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, it's like there are certain specs. I, I know you and I have had these conversations. There's just certain specs that you just don't want to read. The, the thing is, you know, it, your, your spec could potentially have a date of expiration on it when, when I was, you know, trolling around I, for by work. Way, I had this experience on your show where somebody wrote the script and then it appeared. Right, right. So yeah, I wrote a Soprano spec back in 99, and it took place in between seasons two and three of The Sopranos, or one and two. Basically, in my Soprano spec, Tony's mother was a character, and then the actress who played her died, and then subsequently she died on the show, and my spec became irrelevant. Because the fact of the matter is, is like, once you're sending it out, it just feels old. It feels like it's non-topical. So if you're writing for a serialized show, you know, it, it's hard to kind of, you want a piece of material that'll be good for at least, or, and fresh for at least 18 months months so that's something to think about there are outside the box ideas I heard uh, about a writer who wrote a soprano spec after the show ended it was basically like here are the sopranos characters 20 years from now you know and it's about basically like AJ and Meadows lives 20 years in the future and I go okay this is a fascinating kind of concept because I know the show the sopranos but it will be fresh 18 months from now because they're not going to make any more Sopranos. So, you know, those sort of outside the box ideas sort of generate buzz in the community. Have you heard about that guy who did this or this or that? So it's kind of saying like, you know, everybody's writing heroes or everybody's writing house. So how can I write, you know, a show, um, you know, that fundamentally is a little bit different and will will tell somebody that I can have fun with something? Well, can I cross pollinate two shows? What if Friday Night Lights and Heroes existed in the same universe? I'm going to write that spec. Like as crazy and as stupid as that idea idea might be, if you can pull it off and your agent can say, listen to this, <laughs> yeah. that might be interesting enough to get somebody to read it, you know, so be creative and inventive and don't be afraid to fall on your face. And yeah. write to your, your, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, pick a show you know is coming back the next year. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Well, also, write it to your strength. To also, go I'm going to name a bad guy on Lost, Luther Mace. And I hope you're not offended by that, because that is the, the most awesome bad guy name I've ever seen. In <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's right. That's a recurring character. Payment. I think the lesson, again, is if, if you're writing the same spec as everyone else in the, about the same show, that's probably not such a great idea. The idea of combining something, or, which allows an agent to say something, too. For sure. You know, hey. It's not just it. Listen to this. I'd like to see Cormac sell that. Yeah. Here's a guy who crossed He's ready to sell. He did lost yeah. in front of that line. I'm done. Right. Done. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, since you consider uh, compatibility so important, since you consider compatibility so important, do you look at bios of people before they come in, as well as their script, and how much you consider where their lifestyle or you their really life born is? In Teaneck, New Jersey. <laughs> no, no. It's, you're interviewing someone for work that way and, and for compatibility with the culture. Do you look at where they came out of and what they did? You mean their, their pri prior resume? Yeah. You don't mean their, uh, you don't mean their writing yeah. credits. You mean their actual biography. Yeah, where they came where, from. Where, school right. where, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's relevant if you're writing, you know, if you've created a law show if someone's basically like, hey, this guy just became a writer, but he was actually a lawyer for, you know, 20 years, and he will have, you know, he can be a story brain, maybe not a draft writer. Or basically, you know, I my understanding was on the West Wing that they actually employed, you know, uh, people who were either lobbyists or worked in the political arena who were not necessarily writers, but could provide story ideas. So in that case, your bio would become enorm enormously helpful helpful or resourceful. One of the things that we did when we were creating the show was we reached out to like National Geographic to basically say like it would be great if you you know had somebody who knew any basic like sort of survival ideas like what kind of stories could we tell on an island? How would you hunt a boar? How would you find water? How would you do these things? So if somebody came in and you know was a writer and had that kind of a background that would be an enormously helpful thing but it's only as significant as the show that you're targeting. A lot of shows, research is a, is a factor, and that means technical advice is a factor. And a technical advisor can indeed, you know, end up being a writer or a producer. There's a number of cases, obviously, of that. And so in that sense, it's important. I don't think it's important, um, you know, beyond that. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> the question's coming from this side of the room. I'm going to start in row number four back. Yes, you, sir. You, yeah. Look, keep looking around. You, I'm third. Row. Waiting for the mic. Yeah. I just want to ask. I know, uh, Alan, you've got experience with comic book writing. Does that influence like the serialized nature of the show? Do you look at your experience doing that stuff? And I guess Damon, you would probably have comments about serialized natures of shows. 
how far out do you look in advance and what all do you put into those stories, especially as a story, a showrunner? Do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I came into comics, writing comics about seven or eight years into my TV writing experience. So I, I, my TV experience definitely informed how I built my comic books and vice versa. I feel like writing comic books has made me a much better writer all the way around because uh, I guess it's directorial in comic books. Like we're not, I'm not instructed to think extremely visually on Grey's Anatomy or to tell stories um, necessarily that way. It's mostly dialogue driven shows that I've been involved with and, and uh, working with the actors is, is a big part of what I do in television and you don't have the luxury of that in comic books so it sort of, it changed I had my relationship to all of that had to really change in terms of what pure storytelling is. I think coming from TV definitely helped my comic book writing, and I think having had the comic book experience has definitely made me a sharper, more economical television writer. You know, the, uh, to speak to the serialization thing, you know, uh, when when we came on and Desperate Housewives and Grey's all sort of the, the same year, serialization was an incredibly dirty word in network television because at the time, um, basically the fundamental business was those shows don't syndicate. And if a show isn't going to syndicate, the thinking is, why would you watch episode nine of season one of Lost out of context? You know, if you're going to reread a Harry Potter book, you reread it from the very beginning. You don't just go, I'm going to flip open Prisoner of Azkaban and read chapter 16. You know, um, so uh, obviously at the same time, the DVD market for TV was exploding. So there was this new ancillary revenue stream. I'm sure Kevin could talk about, you know, Journeyman, this is probably an uphill battle for them because of the nature of the show, but the idea that the network says we want to keep bringing in new audience and they should be able to drop in at any time and understand what's going on and you have to explain to them over and over again, that's just not what our show is. Like, if they like an episode and sample it, they're going to have to go back to the very beginning. For me, comic books, uh, I was just... I always remember the feeling of comic books that I was into. I could not wait for comic book day when I go to the comic book store and get the next chapter of that. And this is sort of something that Charles Dickens, you know, um, you know, uh, was able to do with chat books. You know, the whole idea of releasing a serialized story in serialized fashion. And we just felt that there would be an audience out there that what all the water cooler TV in 2004 when we came on was reality shows. But the reason that people were talking about those reality shows was all on the same axis of who's going to get voted off next. And, you know, we basically said, let's just take that idea and move it back into drama. You know, we can, we can create water cooler television, but there's nothing water cooler about a procedural drama because CSI, you're going to find out at the end of every episode who did it and why. And, um, you know, same with Law and Order. So why not, you know, launch a continuing story? And comic books are the ultimate continuing story. The idea that Spider-Man literally, you know, for 40 years now has had a continuing story is just ridiculous to me and that people still buy the comic books. So. Television goes back and forth between serialization's working, serialization is is awful and the same with closed end stuff so it's again I think and one of the things that was interesting about this comment was the conceptual conversation that they had about what the show is you know we talk about the practicality of making something of actually getting enough stories or getting the shows on the air but you need to have the conceptual conversations with yourself or with your staff about what is the show when you really get down to a, you know a couple lines or paragraphs you know I don't I think we have this in the library but if not, you can ask one of the people who work at the foundation. My friend Winnie Holzman and I just did a, a series of classes, but we had Larry Wilmore's original handwritten notes from the Bernie Mac pilot, as well as his writer's draft, and Shonda's notes from the beginning of Grey's Anatomy. And if you really want to look at the brain, both those people had such a clear vision of the tone, what the show was about, from before they wrote the pilot. And I would recommend just, you know, stop into the library is, I don't know, ask Adam or Angela um, because you guys really would enjoy seeing that and just seeing that clear vision going into the, uh, going into the writing of the series. There are shows, obviously, CSI 1 or CSI 100, same with Law and Order, that sort of have a routine to them and can be successful. But the shows that are tend to be most remembered or that are groundbreaking can come from some even if it's a tweak on an, on an idea that's, that's, a, that's original or new. Are there, yes? Um, 
How do you develop and maintain your relationship with your audience um, when creating a show and during a show? Because um, obviously that's an important relationship. I feel like that's changed radically um, because of the internet. And uh, I don't know, I'll just start and then you guys. But um, Grace has a very vocal um, fan base who they, we have a website where people can vent and blog and we as writers are obligated to write a blog after every episode of Grey's, which if I had known that, I don't know if I would have taken the job. Um, <laughs> it, it, I hate it so much. It's, so um, it's, it's sh something Shonda absolutely loves. Part of, her, part of the way she launched her career was writing this insane American Idol blog that she was famous for at the time and which you can find online, I think, somewhere. She loves it. It's part of like who she is as a person. She can't wait to do it. And so she wanted to share that creative joy with all of us. And so now um, we literally have to we have, we have to have a relationship with the audience. We have to. ABC.com insists that we do, and now we're doing video blogs. It's, it's really amazing. You can't, you can't not have a relationship with the audience. And um, I, I think it's actually kind of wonderful that there's, a, that there's a dialogue going on and that the audience is now able to invest in a show that feels proprietary for them as well. Why shouldn't we all feel like this is our show? Because without them, we wouldn't be here for Grey's in season five. Um, it can be very, as I'm sure you have experienced, it can be really dangerous to listen too closely to a lot of what they're saying, and you have to take it all with a grain of salt and, and listen to where a lot of it is coming from. But I, I don't know, there have been enough times where I've been hearing the same sorts of things from a certain strain of the audience where we will we'll actually listen to it. And more often than not, it echoes stuff that people have been saying in the room anyway. Why are jo George and Izzy together? That's sort of incest. Don't, do we really want them to be together? And Shauna's like, you don't know what you're talking about. It'll be great. And then the audience says, ew, it's like brother and sister. So it's, it's a lot like that, where they don't tell us anything we don't already know, but they are, we are definitely getting the sense of what's working and what isn't. Not quickly enough to correct it because of how far ahead we are. <laughs> But um, there's a definite conversation going on um, now, and I don't know that that was true when the Mary Tyler Moore show was, you know. You know, you, you have to court your audience, and especially because the internet does exist now, there's this feeling of, you know, um, there's nothing more exciting than sort of going and seeing a band play like at a local bar that nobody knows about yet, and you become a fan of that band, and then like two years later they pop, and you're able to, you have some degree of superiority over the, the, the nincompoops who are just jumping on the bandwagon now because you knew that they were going to be successful then. And to that end, we took Lost to Comic-Con three months before it was on the air. And this is, uh, you know, movies had already figured this out, but TV shows had, and we convinced ABC, let's premiere the show at Comic-Con. And they said, if we put it out there too soon, people won't watch it. And we said, it'll be the exact opposite. You put it out there too soon, and you're going to develop a core community around the show that is starting to market the show just by word of mouth, if you, if you believe in what you've got. And, you know, that... That, that changed for now a lot of shows go down to Comic-Con because that was enormously effective for us. And we return every year. And in fact, we go into radio silence um, you know, after the finale airs and we don't talk about the show at all until Comic-Con. So we're telling our fans first, here's what's coming up next year. So it, it recreates, even though the show now has gone you know, global, that they're still in a room with 4,000 of the hardest core fans of the show. They get to hear first what we're going to do next. So, you know, that, that part of the dialogue is absolutely essential to us. And, and, and again, I think everything that Alan said is, most of the time, by the time the fans are saying, we hate Nikki and Paolo, we've already written the script where Nikki and Paolo are buried alive. Like, you kind of, you, you, you know what's working and what's not working. And fundamentally, it's nice to know that the fans have your back. And, and on our show, it can get very confusing. So it's very helpful to sort of see what questions percolate up that we thought we explained very clearly, but in fact, you, you can't have an argument with the fans of like, no, 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 we explained it there. You either get it or you don't. So then you have to kind of let the writing reflect, you know, in hindsight where you made mistakes. It's a lot like, you know, politicians constantly having to, you know, course correct based on, you know, misinterpretations or things taken out of context. Now, you you your question touched on something, and let me ask Mark, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but obviously, you know, the world of communication is changing. Uh, the internet being a part of that. I mean, I don't know whether you guys like at Endeavor or talk about that or what's going to happen. Not that yeah, anybody all, has all, the answer. We, but. we talk about it all the time. I mean, we don't have the answers. We're desperately trying to find the answers. But you know, if you look at the the upfront, just recently was last week. 
reason to be redundant, but uh, the money is, is, is coming down, ratings are eroding, and everyone's trying to figure out how to fix that. And the internet is going to play a very large part of that, but no one's yet to figure out how to actually monetize that. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I wish we knew the answer. Um, not only the internet, but TiVo. Um, and you know, sort of the younger audience, are they really, because of the internet, able to focus in on something for 60 minutes or 48 minutes, or do they want to sort of multitask while they're watching the shows? I think these are all questions we don't know the answers to, but they're definitely relevant. I was involved in a show called Quarter Life that premiered on the on the net, and was it then was it on NBC? It was a disaster, basically. They've just gotten enough money. I don't think the papers are signed to do quote another season on the net. I mean, it's it's uh, so the world is changing very fast, and it's going to have an impact on I think on all of us sitting here. But the one thing I think is true is there's still going to be stories. I don't know what they're going to be, or how they're going to be, or how you're going to receive them. But they're there, and I don't know if you guys have thought of that. I mean, I think, I think comics actually are pretty important in both being old and new. I mean, it's uh, they've been Spider-Man 40 years, but there is a sense I think that they are feeding almost the new the new media. That there's an overlap there of sensibility. I don't know if you guys have thought about that or talked about it. Well, what's interesting about comic books in terms of now, like a, a an incredibly successful comic book will sell like a hundred thousand copies or something like that. But even as recently as seven or eight years ago, the top sellers were a million. So you you say where where did those nine hundred thousand people go? Did they just did they grow up? Did they stop reading comic books? Where are they? And then Iron Man, which is basically a movie franchise which couldn't get made for the longest time, or Ghost Rider, who are basically ancillary Marvel characters, suddenly do huge numbers at the box office, and you realize that there's something about these stories, or the you know, or the heroic nature of these stories, or it, uh, again, I think I just would echo what you said, John, which is it's it's really the the power of story that drives everything. It's like are these characters that I find relatable? Do I want to go spend time with them? Do I want to buy the toy? Do I want to invite them into my house? You know, I, I it, you know, fundamentally, if I said, show of hands, who in this room actually gets television for free? That is to say, you know, you don't get a cable bill of any kind. And anybody, you know, anybody watch TV on the rabbit ears? So, you know, so you're already used to the concept of paying for TV, you know, so it, fundamentally you know you don't get it for free, but, uh, but the business is trying to figure out the old model of advertisers are for Lost, we have 41 minutes of show and 19 minutes of commercials. So that's two thirds of, of, of the hour is basically consumed by story and the other third is, you know, uh, you know, paid advertising. And if you go back 20 years, that was 46, 47, 48 minutes of show. 50. And, you know, that now you see the most exciting thing that happened at the upfront this, this past week is that Fox basically announced they're going to go back to 50 minutes. So you wow. get 50 minutes of program for just for two shows, for Fringe and for uh, Dollhouse. And because, the, the, because it's J.J. and Joss Whedon, they're going to charge a premium for the 10 minutes. They're going to say, we're still going to be able to make money on these shows, but the advertisers will pay more for them because we believe we'll be delivering eyeballs to the show. So this is their first attempt to see if they can crack sort of the, 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 rap, the rampant TiVoing that's going on. Will people watch commercials if there's less of them? And it's a very bold experiment. I'm, I, I hope it works for and all of, our sake. Of course, like, uh, I think The Closer premiered at like 57 or 58 minutes without commercials, again, to try and pull an audience in and hold them. Uh, but let me ask you, um, is Indiana Jones going to outgross Iron Man? Uh -huh. Did Carlton tell you about our bet? Well, I don't know what you're saying. Bastard. What hap What are the consequences of... The, <clears throat> we got into an old school, new school sort of thing, and I basically, you know, went out on a limb and I said, you know, the reality is, is people are, are so... In Indiana Jones is, is shockingly already having to dig itself out of a hole of expectation and Iron Man had no expectation and therefore I said to Carlton based on my own cynicism about the way that people view this um, Iron Man's going to make more money than Indiana Jones um, because because of this sort of expectation factor. People are like after the whole Star Wars thing are sort of like I'm not going to go I'm not going to put myself through that again. So, if, <laughs> but, but what happens if, if if Indiana Jones outgrows his if, Iron Man? If thing? Iron Man if. If Indiana Jones outgrosses Iron Man by Labor Day, I have to dress up like Iron Man for a day <laughs> and walk to the Disney commissary. And if anybody asks me why I'm wearing the costume, I have to say, because I'm Iron Man. <laughs> 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 
How, Come however, on, everybody. Let's it, go it, multiple it, times. See yes. Indiana We're Jones. We're handing out three wait, wait. tickets to Indiana if, Jones. If Carlton loses the bet, he has to dress up like Indiana Jones, and every time somebody asks him why is Indiana Jones, he has to do something fancy with his whip. <laughs> so, you know, I think that'd be worth it. Right, Carlton's well practiced with his whip. Oh, that's another story. Yes. Geniuses that bring you lost. That's yeah. right. Yes, exactly. sir. We can hear you. <laughs> superhuman powers to bend time dimension after a plane crash why I prevent and create diseases based on my own mood that day. Awesome. Uh, if I had a show, helpful. you'd be like, this guy's good. Now, is the script of that written yet? <laughs> hey, uh, where'd you get that shirt? Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Just uh, go back to the business of writing. Kevin, I just wanted to let, ask you was it just more than numbers that got sports night canceled because there was so much talent in the cast and everything? And more to a general audience, is the business becoming tougher? Um, we've had series get second and, second and third lives. You can't just say it's the internet saving Jericho. We have the Cagney and Lacey story back in the 80s. So what is what makes or breaks a show these days? And is it how is the business affecting the writing and the show's materials that we see? Well, I'll, I'll just the answer to the first part with, with Sports Night was those, just had those bubble numbers. And I think, I kind of I know about a certain meeting that happened, but I'm not going to talk about it. But there's, I think it was Come a bubble on. number. I think Aaron had two shows. And uh, I, I just know it came down between Sports Night and Norm. And Norm, Norm won the day. Wow. Yeah. 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 I think, I think the vertical integration has really, really affected what stays and what doesn't. If you look at Journeyman, for example, which is a show that was produced by 20th Century Fox, not an NBC-related company, um, the numbers were, I think, scrutinized a bit more than some of the other shows. If you look at Life, for example, which is, for all intents and purposes, it was doing the same numbers as Journeyman, that, that show came back because it was owned by Universal. And there was a, a much larger incentive for the network to keep it around because it was all the, the, the profits, the, 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 the losses, the costs, whatever, were all shared internally. And, and I think you're going to see much more of that. I, I really do. I, I think that you're at, Warner Brothers is an exception to this because they're a true independent still. We'll see what happens in the future. Um, but I think if, if you're a, a touchstone show, for example, for ABC, if it's at all working, you're much, much better positioned to stick around. It's actually called ABC Studios. Oh, I'm, that's right. I'm sorry. They, they've completely eliminated the auspices <laughs> yeah, of... Uh, the idea of any sort yes. of differentiation between exactly. the two. Exactly. Yeah. Also, obviously, the patience is less. And that, again, is a factor, I think, of perception and vertical integration. And there's, in the history of series television, there are any number of shows that initially didn't do well and then found their place. Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Uh, X-Files, I mean, there's, um, and there's, uh, we could, Hill Street Blues, I mean, and that. Yeah, the Office, the cheers. American Office was a bubble show after its first season. And that, I think, has become less and less likely to happen. You That's can right. be gone in an episode two, three, it's just, bam, gone. Yeah. On that happy note, are there any more questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, you get a really great spec, spec script agent, um, an agent comes, sends a spec script to you for the new writer, never been hired before, person comes to your office, what do they need to do besides a couple of cartwheels hmm. to get that job? What can they do to get that job? They're in that room with you. No, <laughs> not that. You know, I, I think Robin said this earlier, which is, you know, essentially the first thing you should do is your homework, which is, you would be shocked at the number of people where we, you know, come in and meet on Lost and we say, do you watch the show? And they say, yeah, I've seen a couple episodes. I think it's really cool. If that's true, lie. Like, do your homework. Go on the Internet. You've got to convince the showrunners that not only have you seen every episode of their show produced to that date, you have to know the names of the characters. You have to drop knowledge as a fan of that show and convince them, you know, that it is, it is your favorite show on television and, you know, that's sort of the key. It, it feels like it's sycophancy, which is not the same thing as <laughs> saying, here's what I love about your show, which will also be useful to you. But if you do not have a working knowledge of the show, they will smell it on you. And basically, especially if you're coming on, if you're coming on to Grey's and it's fourth or fifth season and you don't know every single 
you know, iteration of relationships on that show or what medical cases they've done and haven't done, you're going to find yourself operating in an extreme deficit. So, you know, homework, 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 homework. You've got to convince them that, you know, that you've seen every episode of the show and, you know, that's a start. And then the second is, you know, you're going to have, we're writers, like all of us are. And, you know, as a result, some of us are not the most outgoing people. You know, our, our sort of interpersonal skills aren't that great. Again, you have 40 minutes. You're interviewing for a job. They call them meetings. You know, we, uh, we set up a writer's meeting. But it's not a meeting. It's an interview. And, you know, just like anybody who's interviewing for a job, fundamentally it's all about the way you dress, the way you present yourself, the way that you tell stories, you know. Fun, uh, you know, if you go on the Jay Leno show, before you go on with Jay, someone calls you up and you talk to them for half an hour and they do a pre-interview with you and they find your most amusing story so that in your four-minute segment with Jay Leno, you're going to tell your mu most amusing story. So have a canned story that you tell. Like someone's going to ask you, so tell me about yourself. And you, you in three minutes are going to have to say, here's how I came to L.A., here's why I want to be a writer, and here's a, a factoid about me that is very interesting and potentially humorous or, you know, that gives you sort of an angle immediately, brands you as a person. The worst thing you can do is make no impression at all. Mm -hmm. um, this I, is a case also where the reverse bio effect might be. In other words, if you have, if you find out about who you're going to interview with and something about them, and, and don't, you have to be careful not to lie about it, but there's some crossover or common place, school, you know, birthplace, whatever, that is useful too, because that can again make a connection. Not as important as knowing the work. Uh, yeah, I was going to say too, ask questions. If you come in and you're, it's all about you and you want to get all the information out, it can really be off-putting. But, you know, come in and engage with the person. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. IMDB them, know about them, ask questions. I was wondering, I love that thing and see if you can engage them. Hmm. We got to... Do you have a question? Class, class, we're running out of time here, so. Shocking. Can I just double off that? Because before we can get to you, you don't have the microphone either. To you. <laughs> right. I'm going to ask you to piggyback and ask you real quick. Can you just really quickly? Really quickly. Yeah. Really quickly. Really, really quickly. Really, really quickly. <laughs> um, same thing. A new writer sends a really good spec script to you. They come into the office to try and get you as an agent. What, what do you look, how can they? I hope you. Um, that they've done a lot of research on me. No. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I think it's the same exact same answer. Thing. You just want somebody to come in that, that you know is going to make an impression not only on you and your colleagues, but these guys. And you kind of know. Somebody walks in and they're, they're really prepared and they're excited, they're passionate. Um, they engage. They have questions about how the process works. It's not necessarily about the agenting thing, but, you know, what, what do we think about... What, what, what else is out there? What's in the community? And so it, it's, it's, it's the same exact dynamic as going to see a showrunner. It's just making sure there's chemistry in the room. Thank you. So if you have any other questions, ask Mark after we're done. And I want to thank the panel and you all. But let's thank the panel very much.